Right, guys, we're back. I don't know where we got lost, um, but we're back with Kelvin, and um, Gary yeah, has just joined us again. <laughs> so, Gary, where were we, Gary? I was sort of getting through there, and it's, I do apologize about the breakup, but when you're in the four ways area in Kailami, of Kailami network, we don't, we don't have, we don't have a job. I think it's the chrome moly yeah. tubes okay. around here, and it's like a Faraday cage. It's a African problem in general. I don't have this problem when I'm overseas, <laughs> so I feel for you guys. The, the slow internet is a problem, but okay. anyway. Okay, VDL Brothers. Yeah. What is that, and what is it going to be about? Um, so the VDL Bros is a, a brand that me and my younger brother started. Um, it was an, a year ago now when we announced our GD Masters plan to drive together, and... Um, we really receive a lot more support and backing to that than we expected. I mean, it, the response it was fantastic. And um, yeah, a lot of people have been asking what's going on, what are we going to do? So originally it was just more of an update platform. And now it's turned into a brand which you really want to market and um, yeah, give, back, so give something back to the fans and supporters. And yeah, um, leading up to the Kailami nine hour at the end of the year, I think it's something exciting to have two South African brothers um, involved in the event. And I think, um, yeah, something for the South African fans to get excited about. And you're going to have a um, merchandise for sale at the racetrack? That is in plan, yes. Um, so we're definitely going to have some sort of a, a store at the racetrack because we know it was a bit of a problem in the past and we did some merchandising for South African people. They couldn't really, it's not so easy to order online and you know it takes a lot with the postal service and that to South Africa. It was a bit of a nightmare. So we're going to do something a bit more exclusive for our South African supporters and we're going to you know, sell these items on the racetrack. So, I want to challenge him on something. Gary, you, you love doing it, this. Hey, while the camera's it, rolling, yeah, you, you challenge. Right, go for it. Now, you're going to start making, there's going to be cabs, shirts, etc., etc. I'm going to ask you guys, and in order, oh, so it's, a, it's a trade, yeah. okay? So, you give us a couple of caps, a couple of shirts, and whatever the merchandise is that we can give away on our shows and whatever we're doing on a build up to the nine hour. And you can use that to help sell the merchandise. Are we, have we got a deal? I'll make you a deal, Gary. Yes. To say thank you for all the support you guys have given me and my brother, it's no problem. We do it for you guys and we do something cool out of it. I think it's awesome. Awesome. Idea. Boom! <laughs> we <beat> it again! <laughs> Put people on the spot. Thanks, Steve. No worries. No yeah. worries. Appreciate all right. It. Now we're going to his racing career, I think. Well, not the whole career. Just like... What happened the last stuff. time out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> You spent some time in Mauritius with the family, nice downtime, chill time. Looks like you got the fitness and lost a... Like battery's you, charged, yeah. So. Battery's charged and got all skinny. Well, the skinny bird I don't know so much about. We had a lot of uh, desserts that I wasn't supposed to have, but in the end it was a good, good week with the family, which uh, you know, we don't really see so often. So it was nice to see mom and dad and then grandma and grandpa. So it was, it was well spent. Oh, it's difficult hearing Henny referred to as grandpa. Yeah, he's, uh, but he's still sticking around. You wouldn't say he's a grandpa the way he runs up and down that workshop at Funnel and Development. So, uh, yeah, definitely he's still uh, fighting. And, uh, yeah, I guess 70 is the new 18 these days. Oh, I like that because, jeez. Uh, yeah. Um, right, so then you went to Dubai. Yeah. And you had a very interesting race there. Talk us through what, what went down. Well, Dubai 24 was my first. It was my first Dubai 24 hour. So I was heading there with a very open mind. I know the race is always the traditional season opener for, for GT racing. It's always the first one on the calendar. Um, in the past, I was always watching the live stream, as I'm sure you guys uh, did as well. Um, but to race, it was a, obviously a new experience. I went there with a team that I know from, from last season, um, some teammates that I know from last season. So um, I went there with, with a good feeling. Um, the race started extremely well. We, we, after a tough qualifying, we came from 18th up to the top three. Um, and we were really fighting with the leaders. We could really have done something special. And uh, then, yeah, some technical issues st uh, stood in our way. So we weren't really able to, to carry that momentum throughout the whole race. But nonetheless, the experience of the race was unreal. I mean, you have, um, I know on, on the Nordschleife, you have 170 cars on a racetrack, which is, obviously, it's very big, 25 Ks. But in Dubai, we have a racetrack of 5 Ks with 80 cars. So for me, that was even more extreme than what I was used to on the, on the Nürburgring. So that traffic management and stuff like that, I learned an extreme amount from. So um, there's definitely a lot of positives I took from that, which I'm going to carry into the rest of my season. You say you learn about traffic management. Help uh, some of the viewers understand what, the, what is it about the traffic management that, where you need to, to get better at? 
Um, so the main thing is that it's multi-class racing. So you have cars that are maybe, you know, have half the horsepower you have. They're doing a double the length of lap time that you are. And um, at the end of the day, you don't know who's sitting in the car. It could be a pro driver. It could be an am driver from, you know, wherever in the world. And um, you could literally be closing up on him. And you don't know how he's going to react. So it's learning that skill of anticipating what the driver is going to do. And uh, you just learn some tricks during the, uh, along the way on how to react to those situations. Give for, we've got the South African Endurance Series um, and the, the local GNH Transport Supercar Series starting. Give us the, some of the drivers, what are your top two hints of, or tips for traffic management? Um, one of the big ones which I actually took, took along with me is that um, so the, the GD3 cars have ABS fitted to them, which some of the lower class categories don't have. Um, so when you're approaching a, a slower car, you don't want to be super late on the brakes in your ABS because once you're in the ABS, you, you're basically waiting. You, you cannot react as a driver. So when you're approaching traffic that has a much, let's say, worse uh, braking capability than your own car, brake a bit earlier and give yourself some margin to react because you never know what the car is going to do in front of you. So especially in the braking zone, don't go for a lunge or whatever. It's, it, it, nine times out of ten, it always ends badly. So brake that 10, 15 meters earlier where you give yourself that margin on the brakes where you can react. And I think that, that is a way of really staying out of trouble. Um, the second thing is just basically having a clear head, not, not driving in the mirrors, always looking very far ahead. Um, there could be a car that's, that's racing with another car in its category, and you need to see that when you're approaching. So if there's two guys racing each other, I can guarantee you, you're the last guy they're thinking about. They're thinking about the guy next to them touching <laughs> doors with them. So you have to be very aware of that. And when you see that, you, you have to take extra caution when you overtake. So. That sounds pretty much like what I say to Gary often, that you've got to focus and be in the moment and check just, out just what's a happening. question on that. If uh, that's what you actually look at before you're racing these things, do you walk through the pits and have a look at the, the cars that probably do not have this ABS thing? Do you actually recognize so you can recognize the back of the car? Because I'm sure when you're driving, you're coming past a lot of cars and suddenly there's something you might not have seen. So do you spend a lot of time studying other cars? Um, you have a general look at, at the field. So you see how many AM drivers are in the low class categories, how many are pro drivers. But... Uh, I would say the most experience you build up is doing the practice sessions. So you'll probably see a car that, let's say you, you have a yellow car that you're overtaking and you had a, a close call with him in practice. You'll always have it in the back of your mind okay. in the race. I'm going to take a bit more caution around that car. Um, so you generally try and generalize with the cars. So you try and look for a car that stands out or did something that, that made you feel a bit uncomfortable in traffic and, and that you normally let's say, put in your bank of, of knowledge going into the race. And do you share um, with, your, with the other drivers which, you know, watch out for that yellow car, the guy's dodgy as hell? For sure. I mean, that's normally, uh, as, as a guy sharing a car with three other guys normally, or two or three other guys, you're sharing as much information as possible. So when you're coming out of the car, we have normally 60 seconds in the, in the pit stop. That's the kind of things we talk about. We say, watch out for this guy, or there's oil at turn 10, be careful on your outlap. Um, stuff like that. Would you also talk on the radio um, quite a lot? Um. So um, I'm always in touch with my engineer and normally the driver getting in has his own headset before he gets in. So he'll be there about half an hour before he needs to jump in. He's got his own headset. So he can hear everything that me and my engineer are talking about. So normally just before I get in, I'll give an update on what the car balance is like. So he knows more or less what to expect. And also stuff like I just mentioned, if there's oil in turn 10, you know, take it easy on the first lap, feel where the oil is or whatever. These are tips that you really need to be very communicative about with your teammates because at the end of the day, if you didn't give that bit of information, your teammate goes out to turn 10 and he slides in the oil, the, the race is over. <laughs> and talking about turns and the terminology for the, the, the turns, that's pretty much why you've got a map inside the car with all the turns so that there's no confusion. I mean, in the past when I raced Polo Cup, my dad always used to put a map, a big track map on the steering wheel. And actually, I always thought it was just to look cool, you know. It's like how the European guys did it, you know. That, so I felt like part of that European professionalism. But nowadays, I see the meaning behind it. So we use a track map a lot, like you just mentioned, to make reference to certain corners. Um, because our engineer will have the same track map in front of them. Um, so obviously, some tracks, it's difficult to... Um, 
define a corner. Some corners are defined differently on different track maps. So if you have the same track map as your engineer, you can refer to certain corners. And the same applies when you're giving a balance update in the car. You'll say, uh, you'll make reference to a certain corner um, when you're giving a, the engineer some feedback on the car. That balance of the car, that's the ability of the car to be predictable and, and, and have the same sort of slip angles front and back. Do you worry about the balance uh, entry and m entry mid exit, or is it just an overall balance? In general, with an endurance car, you're not looking to get the last two tenths out of a car. So most of the time, I know always on the social media, I see if we've had a qualifying, like for example in, D in Dubai, we were P18. People get like a bit worked up. They're like, "Oh, he was P18 in qualifying. What happened?" But to give you a perspective for us, we're, we're not phased in the slightest if we have a bad qualifying because so much change in the race. We have more focus on the weekend of getting a car that's stable to drive in all conditions. When the tires go off, we want a car that's easy to drive. So qualifying is basically bottom of our priority list. We really could not be bothered if we we're on P1 or P15 on the grid. Um, it's more of a luxury, I would say. So to get back to your question, the balance, we want a, a general good balance, which all the drivers can drive. And generally, we go for more understeer than oversteer because an understeer is a car that over the run develops to oversteer. So you, you know, you always are a bit more safe on on old tyres. It's generally just a, a safer balance to go for for endurance racing. The the oversteer is um, sometimes a lot. It's a lot more fun, not necessarily faster, but it's um, you've got an edgy car that in in traffic and in dodgy track conditions could be difficult. For sure, I mean, and like you say, it's that edgy car is sometimes what you want in qualifying for one or two laps before the tires go off, but for an endurance car, it's an absolute no-no. You don't want to be at two in the morning, you're already tired, you, you know, you're on last legs, and then you have to fight a car that doesn't want to behave either. So that's the last thing you want. So, so you, the bottom line, just to, and we'll move on to Australia um, just now, you're looking for a car that is predictable and safe and... Um, Safe in traffic as well, because you must remember, if you have a car that's very predictable, you, nine times out of ten, will feel more confident overtaking traffic, because you're not scared you're going to lose the rear <coughs> going around the outside or something like that. So they, there's a lot of factors playing into it, just to, yeah, to add to that. Awesome. Now, Australia. Yes. Same team, same lineup. Um, and last year, it's Fred Vavish, uh, Garth Tander, and yourself in the Valvoline car. Yes, that's correct. So, obviously, Bathurst was a very big highlight last year. Um, we made it to the shootout. We were able to fight for the pole position. Um, I know we just spoke about qualifying not being that important, but uh, for Bathurst... But for Bathurst, it is. For Bathurst, it's a bit different because it has that history of the shootout and there's all that an anticipation for the race. So that And it's good for the sponsors. Exactly. So, <laughs> for Valvoline, we definitely got some good uh, TV coverage and... Um, yeah, in general, which is an extremely fun event, so I'm happy to go back. What are you looking forward to most? You've, you've now got an, a, a, a team unit that you know, the guys running the car, you know the car well. It's an updated um, 2019 car? Um, no, for Bathurst, we have to run the old spec. It's just a regulation for Bathurst. You have to run the previous season spec, so unfortunately the, the Evo won't be there, but we will have the Evo for Daytona. So. But it also makes a bit of sense to have the... You know, from an econ um, economics point of view, that you know, you, the big big race is run with equipment that people are comfortable with from the previous year. Yes, for sure. And I mean, uh, it definitely adds to the to the grid that we had this year. I mean, we've got 28 GT3 cars. I mean, for a global event like that, it's pretty impressive. I think to have 28 fully professional cars on spec that can fight for a win. So that. And you said 10 manufacturers. 10 manufacturers, you know, which makes it even more spectacular. I think is something for everybody, whatever fan you are, of whatever manufacturer, there's something for you. Um, so from that point of view, it's probably one of the races to be at for the season. Yeah. Right. So. 24 hours, you've clearly you've got a plan for that now um, in your head already. There's last year, it didn't end well for you, but you say you've learned a lot from that. And do you think that you a lot more, clearly you, you're a better driver now than you were last year? I mean, I wouldn't say I'm a faster driver or a... No, I meant better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not, not necessarily yeah, I mean, more... Yeah. Um, I wouldn't, yeah, so from that point of view, yes, for sure. Um, every year, if you compare yourself to the year before, at least for me, that's, it's like that. I feel like I'm a completely diff different driver 
in complete package to the year I was before. So that's always a good thing. You always need to strive for that growth um, from season to season. Otherwise, you know, there's no point to, to carry on going. So I'm coming back to Bathurst with a, a wealth of knowledge now, uh, which I didn't have last year as a rookie. And of course, like you said, we have the same team. So everybody knows their, their role now within the team, which is, it's a nice luxury to have, I have to say, because as an Audi driver, we're, we're jumping around so often. Every weekend I'm in a different car with a different team, different teammates. And, you know, it's difficult um, to get to know everybody in such a short time and, and click. And then when you have the luxury to really come back with the same team, I think that is really something you need to use as a strength because, yeah, it can, it can only contribute to the success. Do you have your same engineer that goes with you or each race, each new team, you, you've got a different engineer? Um, well, generally, each team will have their own engineers that are contracted to the team. They're, um, you know, working there during the week. So, you know, when I change teams, I'm changing engineers as well, which is, which is tough at the same time because, you know, some are French, some are German, some are English, you know, some are South African even. I've worked with some pretty good South African engineers in my time. Um, and that all takes time to get used to, you know. Um, everybody has a different way of working. Everybody <laughs> likes different things or communicates in different ways. So you really got to be on the ball to, to get onto that and, and, and get the weekend rolling quickly. But I think that's also, um, at, I mean, you, you still, I was going to say a kid, but you're not. You're a young, very young um, adult. And the, the steep learning curve of jumping from team to team, new environment, learning the skill of very quickly grasping the, the personal relationships and the skill with the engineers, it, it must be quite exciting, actually. It definitely is because it always keeps, keeps something fresh. I mean, I drive the same car the whole year, so at least you've got to shake something else up, you know, uh, make it a bit interesting. So from that point of view, it keeps me excited. It keeps me motivated to, to build new relationships. And I have to say, you meet some pretty cool people around the world, you know, and you work with some really intelligent people. And, you know, from each guy, you take that little bit that you really enjoy. So if you work with an engineer in Australia, maybe there's something he does in his in his let's say system that you really like you keep that and you put it in your pocket and you take it with you to the next race and that's how you kind of build up your let's say toolbox for for the rest of the season so in that point of view i'm very lucky to to do the amount of races that i do every year because i grow so much faster than the guys that maybe do five or six a year and also sit in the same environment get used to doing things the same way and um so monday you fly out to murica daytona You've got a smile. You look, you're really looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, Daytona is just also, it's that, that race at the beginning of the year. Everybody's watching. It's a fantastic crowd we have. Um, it's a new season, so obviously I'm full of motivation. And to top it off, I've got a great team behind me, some great co-drivers. So, you know, when you come into a weekend and you know you can do something special, it's always a cool feeling. Have you got the refueling sorted? <laughs> well, I've changed teams. <laughs> Let's see if they've got it sorted out. But, um, yeah, I'm sure I've got a great team in the hands of WRT. So. And from a, a track at Daytona, it's got the, the banking si- side of it and the, the, the infield. And the infield is it's not smooth. It's a bit bumpy. Which are the, the enjoyable parts and which are the big challenges? Um, it's like you say, the, the infield is not the most difficult to do, but it's very bumpy. So on your body, it takes a lot of strain over 24 hours, you know, when you're bouncing around in the seat and whatnot. Um, but uh, Daytona as a whole is just a special place. I mean, you're driving with DPIs, you're driving with GTLM cars. When you come on that banking, I mean, I went now for the test, we did a track walk. And every time I'm absolutely gobsmacked by how steep the... Um, the banking is you know you literally could crawl up there you know you could literally stand up like this and you as as i'm putting out my hands now that's that's basically i would be touching the banking that's how steep it is and you know then you think obviously the nascar guy is doing three or four wide there at 210 miles an hour i'm I'm absolutely mind blown so to to have that experience as a driver and see you know what also other series are experiencing it's fantastic and it's something i'm really happy to have in my bucket list and to be able to take off the only thing i don't have as you can see i don't have a rolex watch which is the the big prize at the end of the <laughs> well, <his> motivation <laughs> yeah exactly so i've made a pledge to myself i'm not going to buy a watch ever until i win a rolex and then i'll then i'll maybe be you know 
I'll get my first watch going. But for the moment, I'm not a watch guy. I like r uh, running my wrists empty and we'll wait for the Rolex. So. But you've, you've got this new intelligent slimline look, great haircut. Um, this is a new beginning for a new year. Yeah, as every year you try and come with new motivation and a new kind of mindset. Um, it's going to be my, I think, well, since 2014 I've been in GD3. So how many years there now? Six? Uh, five, five, I six think. Years, five years. So, man, I, I tell you, to be back for a fifth year is something I, I never would have expected in my wildest dreams. Um, I think there's a lot of people that also betted against that uh, when I first started overseas. But it's cool, you know, and I'm happy to be back in GD3. There's some milestones I still need to achieve and want to achieve for myself before making another step. Um, what is that next step? My next step, I mean, my brother obviously got the, the DTM seat now, which I'm extremely proud of. It's unbelievable. It's, it's fantastic. Like you said, it's unbelievable, actually. And, you know, uh, he's, got, he's the youngest DTM driver now, isn't he? Uh, yes, he will be the youngest DTM driver. And just for our family, for South Africa, I think it's fantastic to show that it's possible for our young carters, for everybody involved. I think that's what we need. I think South Africa has, in general, seen a, a big rise in, in motorsport. We're having the likes of Brad Binder, Darren Binder, myself, Jordan Pepper, my brother, David Perrell. I could name many more that are actually going overseas now. And you see it every year growing. I mean, there's more guys going overseas than, than I mean, when I first started. No, you were the lo lone the South Africa. the only guy that was now taking on this, this venture that was basically impossible, you know. Um, and now we've... Um, as a group, we've, we've all changed that, that mindset for South African people that, you know, it is possible if you go over there and you put in the work, first of all. Sure, it's, it's very tough financially and whatever it is, but there is a reward at the end of the tunnel. And if you do work hard, you can make it. So, so apart from the financial difficulties, and motorsport is not cheap. It's never meant to be cheap. It's not a um, democracy. It's a meritocracy. If, what is the... Talking to the, the Carters and somebody with a burning ambition to follow in your footsteps, what is the single or maybe two piece of, pieces of advice you could give them? Well, I actually already mentioned it. it's, it's hard work. You've got you've to realize that what you're getting yourself into is not something you just do on weekends. Um, a lot of people have that kind of mindset that oh, we go karting on weekends and you know, go have some fun and then Monday it's back to school and we carry on with normal life. But for me at least it was a thing where racing never stopped. When I wasn't at the racetrack I was preparing in the gym or whatever it is. And maybe, you know, being able to run a 5k two minutes faster will not make you a fast racing driver. But it will make you a mentally more ready racing driver. And at the end of the day it's about having the complete package. Uh, it's not about being fast. Um, to get not, not only fast. Yeah, you need exactly. Speed. I mean, you need speed, but it's not the only thing, especially in endurance racing, that I can definitely say. Um, to come to the financial side, sure, you need, you need that background. Um, I was lucky enough to have my family that could give me a start in karting. Um, and that's, to be honest with you, if you don't have a big sponsor behind you, you need that family background just to, just to give you the first year or two in karting to really see if that's something that you want to do for racing and, and, and really commit to it. After that, there's an abundance of opportunities. You can get into this, um, the Ferodo and Federal Mogul program, which has really been backing young talents from karting to, to tin top racing. Um, they were my stepping stone from karting. They funded my career in South Africa. Um, so that's something you need to get into. You know, One, If you can prove yourself in karting, guys like these will come on to you. There's, talent always finds a way. And I'm convinced that if you make these small steps, the right sponsor and the right person will always find you. But it's up to you how you place yourself, how you present yourself, um, as to how quickly that happens. So it really is actually about your kind of attitude and, and how you go forward. Well, sure. I mean, you see a lot of, um, you know, of the top sportsmen in the world. None of them have a story where it's been easy. Go look at Lewis Hamilton. Go look at Messi. Go and look at all these guys. They were young kids coming from a very poor family background, they found what, they were, what their destiny was, and they worked hard at it. And sure, they had financial backing, whatever, but they got that because they worked extremely hard. I always use the Lewis Hamilton um, example where he went to Ron Dennis. I mean, for sure. How cheeky was that? Exactly. But, you know, at the end of the day, these are the things that people like that, they, they remember that stuff, you know. And that was something that made him stand out. I can guarantee you the other 10 kids that were standing behind Lewis at the time would not have had the balls to do that. 
and you've got to have something that sets you apart from the rest. So that's awesome. <laughs> Kelvin, you've been a great brand am ambassador for South Africa, for your family, and for, for motor racing. On your, the start of more travels to America and Australia this year, we, I think on behalf of everybody, Gary, we wish you immense speed. And hope your, your results reflect your dreams. Thank you very Good much. Good luck. Thank you very much. And I have to say, you know, I follow the show, as you guys know, always when I'm overseas. You guys give me a young shout out. Um, keep doing what you guys are doing because you guys are, are expanding the motorsport overseas as well. You're exposing that to all the people. You're, you're making it accessible for everybody. And I think that's the way we were getting the young guys to see what the likes of myself, Jordan, uh, the Binders are doing, this is what we need. And I think you guys also have a, a big part to play in that. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited what the future holds for Kailami as well. Let's ride this wave. You never know how long this wave is going to last. So let's get as South Africans behind this whole project. Let's get as many South Africans competing as well. And let's see what we can make of it. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Kelvin. Thank lot, Kelvin, thank you very much. No worries, man. Thank you. Awesome. Gary? It's all the dust in the air, China. Yeah. I just want to know. Yes. With all this going on, DTM, this, that. Yeah. What is the chess like in the funnel in the household at the moment? I'll tell you, it must be unreal, eh? Well, he's still there. Let's ask him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, we need to wrap up, eh? Because we've got, we've got another funnel in the coming in next week. Yeah. So Sheldon will, will come and talk to us. And so on your travels, good luck. I was, I was like, Mom, Dad, Granddad, and everybody else out there that is watching... I will get to your comments when we finish the show. Couldn't watch them at the same time. But thanks for dialing in. We dig, we dig your support. Thank you. Awesome. Again. Guys, have a great weekend. We'll be back on Wednesday next week, 6 o'clock, for another episode of Waved Yellow. Have an awesome weekend. Cheers.